Welcome to Inside the Recording Studio. This is episode two. I am Jody Whitesides, and this is Chris Hellstrom. Good morning, Jody. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing all right. Fantastic. Doing all right. I'm ready to get going here on episode two. And um, you were feeling a little under the weather last yeah. episode, so hopefully you're feeling a little bit more on the mend today. Just a little teeny tiny bit. Yeah, it's brutal to be you sometimes, but I'm sure <laughs> you'll pull through. It's brutal to be a lot of people sometimes. This is true. <laughs> My father-in-law always used to say, when you asked him how he's doing, he said, better than most, not as good as some. And I always thought that was a great way to say it. It is a good way of saying it. I like to say yeah. I'm alive and not unwell usually. <laughs> that's all, that's also quite good. Yes, but I got that from George Carlin. That's, that's a good uh, role model, I suppose. I think so. Yeah. So we're not talking comedy today. Today we're talking about uh, guitars in the studio. Yes. So I've heard. Yeah. Last episode, we had a little bit more of an overarching type of vibe uh, about what we're going to try to do here. And uh, today we're going to go into a little bit more detail and uh, talk about guitars, how you and I might go about recording guitars and hopefully somebody else will get some tips and tricks from this as well. Yes, sir. So um, kick us off. I will kick us off. The first thing I want to bring up, and this is probably really obvious, but it probably deserves to be said anyway, is make sure that your instrument is in good working order. When no way, to... dude. I want it to be as crappy as possible. I know, right? Just kidding. Uh, straight. So, that, so what, what does, does that actually mean? mean? What are you talking about when it's in good working order? That uh, fresh strings, you that got can help. Intona- yep. Yeah, uh, your guitar is set up for intonation is fine. That's which, pretty much a. That's like the big one right there. It's like yeah, I caught a and, fish this big, and that's going to go right outside the width of the screen here. <laughs> um, so, intonation. If let's pretend that somebody doesn't know what that means that is basically ensuring that your guitar is in tune across the whole neck so well the strings playing, are in tune with themselves right up each but string you, each fret etc let's say that for example like you play a d major chord in the open position that's also sounds like a major chord moving up the neck all the way up so uh that's intonation and that can be a pain in the butt to fix um Unless you have dedicated software for that kind of thing. So just just make sure your guitar sounds good when you That's get ready one. to record. Yeah. yeah. Um, how are you on the stance of completely fresh strings or not? I, I you know, <laughs> I'm probably terrible to ask that question because I change strings so rarely. Yeah. Uh, the main reason for that, I think, is because my fingers mm-hmm. aren't like a lot of other people's fingers in that they don't corrode the strings. Ooh. So I don't special? leave. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm kind of lucky in that regard. I don't leave finger goo all over strings for some reason. My fingers just don't leave goo. So my strings tend to last a really long time before they sound really, really dead. Yeah. So, but I, I think a part of that, a lot of that would actually come across is like how dead do the sounds or strings sound? What does the song actually call for? in regards to the sound of the strings in the guitar. Right. Those are kind of like the two things that really kind of determine, do the strings need to be changed for me as my own personal guitar player? Right. I uh, I prefer new-ish strings. I, I do not recommend... Um, Brand spanking new? Right. I mean, if that's the case, when you just, oh, I got to, let's say you bust a string and you're, you're changing everything, I would uh, try to sit down and play them for you know, at least half hour or an hour just to make sure that they're probably stretched out or you else know, you're going to deal with. Also, the way I end up, re, I guess, restringing a guitar, I tend to stretch the bejesus out of them before I even play them. Yeah. So. But if you're doing the tracking, um, you don't want to be, oh, man, that, that G string went out of tune again, you know, and you're doing take after take. So, so um, very true. Yes. Yeah, stretch them out and uh if you have to change them right before i like to do it if i let's say i might do it the evening before if i'm doing any tracking and i really need to to change them that kind of thing uh but that is up to obviously the individual sometimes if you like you said for for the sound of the song it might be 
beneficial to have little deader strings if you want a little bit more of a mellower sound or or it just it, it carries itself a certain way but uh yeah well, fresh strings also, are always nice it also depends on the type of string if you run super mellow then you're probably going to go with uh, flat wounds instead of normal round wounds that most people are used to sure or you have just a you know an amp kind of combination where that just that's how you get your sound type of thing but uh you also don't want to be that they're so bad that you're you're playing and you're you're breaking a string and you're constantly changing that kind of thing so yep but good working order and that goes the same for you know pots and knobs and all this kind of stuff make sure that there's you know no buzzing or any of that kind of stuff because it, you know what's really good for that i'm just going to interject right here this stuff you called deoxit d5 or dn5 deoxit yeah. dn5 uh, if you ever have problems with your pots of any kind, not the kind you cook with in a kitchen, but the kind that you have in electronics, uh, yeah. this stuff is like miracle worker stuff. It's pretty darn cool. 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 I might have to get some of that and check it out. Um, so then once you have your gear, let's say everything is in working order. Um, other things to consider is what type of guitar does the song call for? Uh, if you're doing a metal track, you might not want a 64 Strat, you know, uh, same thing goes for if you're going for, uh, again, let's say that you're going for another metal track and your other guitar is, uh, 335, it might not be the best guitar for the job. <laughs> I guess it depends uh, on the guitar player because Richie Blackmore might disagree and so might Ted Nugent, but that's that's another era. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, um, uh, you know what? I'm not even going to touch that. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> can't touch. It's like MC Hammer. Can't touch that. Boom. Yeah, or shouldn't touch that. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, you can make anything work, but if you're trying to get a certain sound, that the uh, the more appropriate guitar that you have for that uh, is good. Um, if you're Again, I'll flip the coin. If you're going to do a jazz tune or, or jazz standards, maybe you don't come in with your humbucking guitar, you know, with, with bare knuckle pickups or something like that. Sure. So um, now, if you only have one guitar, then that's your guitar. That's, that's the one your that choice. You have. The, yeah, the best you guitar get. you have is the one that you have, right? Or the best guitar to use is the one that you have. Um, exactly. But if you do have the option, you know, try to match that up a little bit. Um, so it's, I mean, it's nice to have, if, I mean, if you're like a, a Joe Bonamassa where you can just, <laughs> you have a museum at home with, with guitar gear and just use whatever you want. Uh, that's great. Wouldn't that but, be lovely? Uh, it, it would be, right? I would love to see his play sometime. Just see everything that he has there. Amazing. Uh, so he's a bit of a connoisseur. Um, but he kind of sounds like it too. He's got great tone and great feel. Amazing player. So um, so that leads us a little bit further down the signal chain. And we go into amps. Amps. Well, we kind of yeah. forgot about pickups a little bit, right? Because the pickups actually pick up the sound of the strings and then send us to the amp. Yep. Yeah, this is true. So maybe we'll we'll touch on that a little bit. I kind of lump that in with the guitar, but um humbucking versus single coil. Yes, and there's all kinds of choices, whether they're active or they're passive or they're stacked single coils or whatever. Right. Yeah. So again, what you're going for, if Piezo. you're going for yeah, if you're going for a cleaner sound, you might want to go with the you know, a single coil. Or there's even coil tapped humbuckers, that kind of thing to emulate different types of sounds. So uh, I guess it's something to kind of consider even before you're, you're recording is that what you see yourself doing when you're when you're getting a guitar and what will you be able to get out of it? Um, what is that there, guitar for if you're buying right. more than one? Right. Or even if you're buying your first one, what is it that you want to do? What, what kind of music do you, do you see yourself playing and uh is there flexibility enough in the guitar to cover different bases that kind of thing um but that's a little bit and off he doesn't topic. mean bass guitar no <laughs> that's no. a whole other episode <laughs> the bass yeah that, that's <laughs> down the line a little bit um so yeah just consider tonal choices and try to go for the most appropriate for the job um there's a reason you know why a lot of 
rock and metal players play humbucker style guitars. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of country players have tellies, you know. Um, it is the sound of the system. Sound of the system, right, right. So, um, are you ready to move on to amps? Or yeah, let's you... do it. Yeah, actually, you know, we should go. probably touch while we're talking about pickups, because uh, you recently, or fairly recently, got a POS Strat. I did. It is and, an Affinity uh, Squire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you busted the bank on that one. But, oh, uh, it, was, it was such a bust. It was 60 bucks for this. Ooh. $60 for an Affinity Squire. Wow. Yeah, it was yeah huge. so... But five bucks a month for 10 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you did something to that. To I, make did. It work I did. I did actually really a couple well. of tell things. Tell us about to it. that. Uh, yeah, one of the things the that I thing. did with this particular guitar is that I installed the Fishman Fluence Fender pickup thing for strats. I, I don't, I guess that's the exact terminology. It's, a, it's the Fender Fluence uh, strat pick guard and pickups. Right. And it took, what would probably be considered a Yugo of a Strat <laughs> in terms of its body. And I put in a Ferrari for its internals or a Lamborghini or however you'd like to make a car definition of it. It right. now sounds absolutely amazing in terms of the way it sounds. It sounds just like a real Strat. The really cool thing with this particular model of the Fluence pickups is it has a push pull knob to it mm -hmm. that turns it from the normal, uh, I guess just Fender Strat to the Texas Heat style Strat sound. Cool. So you get a little bit more output. Yeah, it gets a little more output, a little more, a little more grit, a little more gain. But cool. for single coil pickups, the technology in those fluences, and not to be like spouting off about product, but um, it's amazing stuff for single coil pickups. No hum. Yeah. Dead quiet. Just that in silent. itself. It's amazing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, because that, that that's something. Again, if you're doing something, let's say that you're you got a strat and you're playing a little bit of blues or something like that, you you sound like you're got a little distortion on there, and you sound like you're sponsored by DWP. You know, just like <laughs> super Where if crunchy. you go on the Spinal Tap route, you get that. Bring it one five. We're coming in for a landing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Spinal Tap. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you have. I mean, it could be a quick fix, if not necessarily a cheap one. But if you have a guitar that plays really well, but you're not necessarily thrilled about how it sounds. Um, yeah, well, and that's why I went with the Fluence. It, the funny thing is, is those pickups cost more than the, you know, the 60 bucks that I spent. They were well, several well, sure. dollars for the pickups. <laughs> right. Uh, and it was a little bit of a trick to install them because the body on that is actually a little thinner than a standard strat. So the back end hmm. where it's routed out to fit the pick pickups in is yeah. pretty paper thin. I could probably punch a hole through it with my pinky. Really? Yeah, it's pretty thin because it's wow. not a, it's not a standard width on the body, so it's a little bit thinner. Right. But huh? Okay. All right, but well, it hey, still it, it plays great. That's Sounds the main great. reason why I picked it up is because when I played it, it was like, wow, this thing plays awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I knew at some point I was going to replace the pickups just because they were pretty crappy sounding pickups. But the guitar in and of itself sounds fine and played great. So it's like, why not pick it up for 60 bucks? Right. There you go. There you go. So, um, yeah, it can vastly improve just something like that. Um changing pickups well and the uh, humor of the, the question just now is this morning i got a text from a friend of mine who is wanting to learn to play guitar mm -hmm. and i was trying to tell him it's like you know if you want to do this then you get that and trying to give him all the options and right. this morning he texts me having not heard from him for like probably a month <laughs> yeah. he says i'm buying a cheap ass strat and i'm going to upgrade it as i go and i kind of went okay that's not the biggest concern you need to have, but the biggest concern that needs to be that whether or not the neck is in good working order. Right. Because the truss rod actually cheap, do something. Yeah. yeah, those cheap guitars can have warped or twisted necks or they don't into uh, they don't uh, flex right from the truss rod adjustments. So there's that's the most important thing when you're picking up cheap guitars, which is why I bought this one that I showed in the video. Um because it played great, the neck was in good working order, and it didn't have any warps or twists to it, and it was adjustable. So, yeah. There you go. 
There you go. Yeah, things things to consider. Um, and obviously to round that off, it's like those are things that would be need to be taken care of before you start tracking, or you're going to be fighting it all the way. Yeah. And uh, whoever's ending up recording you is. is I'm not gonna like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like you very much right now. Right, your or at guitar, least not your guitar. Yeah. Um, so amps. Yes, now, amps. This will be, uh, which probably flash a little nerd alert here because now we're, we're going to talk about not just amps, but amp simulation. Yes. 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 And, uh, yes. Both you and I are big believers in it. Big uh, believers? Oh, cool. Yes. Yes. I, well, we've been using it for a long time, both you and I, and it's really, really, really good. Is this uh, another one of the things that's my fault? <laughs> no, I don't think it's your fault. Um, I, I think I I probably jumped on the bandwagon possibly before you did, I think. Mm. Um, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But um, it gives you a choice. Yes. Right. If you're um, when you're tracking, are you do you have an amp that you really, really like and you're going to end up miking that up? Uh, depending on where you're tracking, is that an option for you? If you have, um, let's say, a bedroom studio where you like to do your work. Um, you're playing yeah. too loud. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, your, your neighbors might not like to hear that riff at three o'clock at night, you know, when you have to crank your amp to get the tone. Um, but if you have it, you have an amp that works really well, sounds really well, go right ahead and mic it, you know, go for it. Uh, it's going to sound awesome. If you, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're doing, that kind of goes without saying, I think, but yeah. Um, so the opposite of that is um, simulations now in software. Yes. Right? Or yeah. even hardware, because there are some hardware or, units that do the same sure, sort of thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's <clears throat> everybody is doing them now, right? So there's, we'll, we'll mention a couple later, but um, it gives you again a lot of flexibility. Um, it's unfortunate. I think we've all at one point or another have, have tracked a guitar tone with mic'd up amp and everything, and. You realize that when it comes time to mix, it's like, oh man, I could have used a little bit less gain or or whatever it is, and uh, just having the flexibility of going back and being able to do that. Yeah, uh, there is with, that. Uh, yeah, that, so uh, I think the myth that they don't sound good. Um, well, it is a myth. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, certainly today. Absolutely. You know, I think people might have had a point like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, but um, today. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, actually, no. I think 10 years ago was when I kind of put my amps in storage easily 10 years ago. Well, actually, a little more than 10 years ago. Yeah. I haven't really used amps since. Which was it that, that was it the Studio Devil stuff? That, that... It was, it was the, the, yes. So Mark Gallo from Studio Devil. Yeah, uh, I was walking by his booth at Nam and right. heard this guitar sound. I was like, "Holy cow!" <laughs> yeah, it's more like "Holy shit!" But I'm trying right. to be a little bit more, a little reserved. bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I was floored, and it's hard to be floored at Nam in terms of like <laughs> when you hear yeah. something because it's yeah. such a cacophonous uh, yes. environment that it's very difficult to kind of get a gauge of what something really sounds like and to get floored just by walking by a booth and hearing something is like whoa so i stopped talked to him had me yeah. check it out whole deal it was the operation of how he was doing his plug-in from the studio devil guitar amp pro where he was using these impulse responses by another company called red wires yes um and that was that that was the secret sauce that suddenly turned my head and get and it was like, yep, that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, the now IRS, software yeah. amps sound real. And at that time, a lot of the amps software had cabinet simulations. Right. And Red Wires was doing cabinet impulse responses with actual like vintage cabs of various kinds and actual microphones. Right. And as and soon, as, would, and, soon yeah. as I started experimenting by turning off the cabinets in the simulation software and replacing it by stacking it just like you would a hardware amp, 
uh, yeah. with a head and then a cabinet from Red Wires, it was like, bingo, there it is. Yeah. That's the exact same sound that you're going to get in a studio environment or a live environment when you're miking up a cab. It made yeah. it made it so close in difference that it's probably 99% that yeah it's it's that's how close it is to real sounds yeah no, and or actually not i wouldn't say to real sounds it should be better stated as hardware versus software sounds there is a ever so very very slight difference in terms of what could be considered the feel of a situation but that just comes down to the uh mental well, just what you get the mental to, block right? between a, a guy that only wants to play hardware amps compared to software amps right i think it's and a that, mental thing yeah i i agree and i think that's one of the the knocks too that people tend to say and i say people i, I mean guitar players uh so well it, it doesn't sound like i'm standing in a room with my stack no but that's it, it's not going to right but that's completely unless you turn the volume the, way up right but that's completely missing the point because it's not trying to emulate that what it's trying to emulate, or what it does emulate, I should say, is a mic'd up amp. Yes. It's not emulating the room where you're standing with and it's blowing your hair back and you can smell the tubes and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, that's that's probably another plug-in <laughs> idea right there, the tube smell. Tube um, smell. Hey, I like yeah, it. Right? Does it burn? Um, yeah, it burns. Uh, but you're, you're emulating what the mic'd up signal sounds like. Yes. And so once you you sort of take a step back and realize what it is that you're listening for, and two, uh, I think it's ridiculously good. Well, and that's really, why I say really, really it's good. that one percent difference. It's the the one percent is the difference between you're standing in a room with an amp cranked to eleven, right. compared to sitting in a room with an amp that sounds like it's cranked to 11 going through monitor speakers at you at a much lower volume level. And that's that right. 1% difference to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, but even and I don't, it's one of my things that gets on me. With, oh, it feels like an app. It feels like playing through an app. Um, I think that that's, I think that that comes down to a little bit of the latency and everything in plugins. And that's something that also has gotten really, really good. I mean, the, the machines that we're running today are so powerful that it's negligible. Well, or, or the latency like, now, I, and I've never really had a problem with the latency, right? Uh, mainly because I've always been recording them with Mac Pros since I mm -hmm. started doing the software amps. But um, I can understand if the say the sample buffer is set to 256 i can feel that and that feels wrong oh sure but when sure. it's at like 64 or even 128 depending on the sample rate that you're recording at you're talking such a minimal amount that you'd have to be standing so far away from your amp to, to notice it it's ridiculous yeah. it's literally the the latency on even something that's at 128k or 128 sample buffer is akin to being like probably 30 feet away from your amp i think it's it's yeah. pretty pretty low but right. as soon as you start hitting 256 at least for me that's where it really starts getting noticeable so yeah and then i can understand it but i've never had that problem right and the one thing that also has gotten you know much much better uh, that was a bit of a fair knock, to be honest, on the the originals of these, is the um, how the software reacts to dynamics. Yes. So that if you're playing softer, a lot of them will will clean up and 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 dig in a little bit more as you as you play it harder and all that kind of thing. So well, all those that, things. Yeah, there was ahead. a point probably I did a recession with um, a guitar player who was playing with. Um, somebody who had just won, uh, he was playing guitar for somebody I think who had just won like American Idol. Okay. So he was going out on tour and we were doing an album of guitar oriented instrumental music and he rolls into my studio 
And he says, I got my stack out in my car. Where do you want me to bring it in? I looked at him. I said, you're not bringing it in. We don't need it. And uh, I don't want to out his name because I think that'd be rude. But... Yeah, no, that's, that doesn't need to be And And yeah. so I go, what kind of sound do you really want to be playing through today? And he uh-huh. named something. So I quickly whipped up a setup on a channel strip within like, I don't know, two, three minutes uh-huh. and said, here, plug in. So he plugs in and he starts playing and he's just like, whoa. I'm like, yeah, what else do you need? What do you, what do you want me to do? He goes, well, can you add this? And so I added some like delay on it. And then I added a little more reverb and he was like, wow, this sounds really amazing. He goes, what's it like though, when you like back off on the volume? And he's yeah. like, well, go ahead and try it. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he rolls his volume back and starts playing a little quieter. And it sounded just like an amp being rolled back and a little quieter. And his jaw just hit the floor. He was like floored. And that at that point, he didn't want to go out and get his stack. He was like, let's, we're ready to go. So I just thought that was really interesting because it's a guy who had to be shown that it was possible. And that was like 2010. So that was 10 years ago. Um, And at that point, that's when I think the guitar amps really kind of took the back seat for me. And it's not that I don't, I'm I'm a tube amp aficionado. I just, I don't, I've got hundreds of amps to choose from now in software with hundreds of cabinets with, a plethora of mics so I can get any sound I want under the sun. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, I think it, like you said, it's come a long, 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 long way where, where I think the flexibility for somebody like me and to mention Bonamassa again here, unless you're a guy like him, when you got like a museum worth of amps, right? where you can just pick and choose okay i want this and i want this and i want that fantastic go for it use your favorite mics in front of them and all that kind of stuff but uh for us deadly people um this gives us a lot a lot of flexibility um and also this is something that you and i talked about with some of the stuff that we've done it it really encourages for experimentation as well yeah well i've spent hours just tweaking knobs and sounds on the software amps equally as much time as when i was first learning to play guitar through regular amps yeah i've spent tweaking and dialing in and then redwires recently released a a version three update to all of their software and everything which made the interface lightning faster Yep. And increased the impulse response, or the imp, yeah, the impulse or response the is the they're they're right. now like ten times bigger mm-hmm. in file size, right. so they can capture a lot more volume and everything else, and and the low end is better organized now in them, and it's amazing how much better they sound. It actually, it makes a that little one percent difference from the previous product to this product that just makes it that much closer to being a hundred percent, like playing through a real amp. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, that's, you know, big ups to red wires. The amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Mike Mike from red wires. Great guy. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, but when, let's say to backtrack a little bit here, um, miking an actual amp. Yes. Um, do you have favorite microphones that you'd like to do for that? And uh, would you share those with us, please? Well, the main the main mic that I tended to use when I was miking amps was the SM57 Beta. Yeah. And that Why was, Beta? Because that's the one you had? Or, that's or? the one I had. I never went oh. out and just got a regular old 57. I always had the Beta. So. Yeah. Um, because when I bought it, I was told it was better. And you always, <laughs> sometimes that marketing it had a spiel will work. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, but I've had that mic forever. I think that was the first mic I ever bought was a 57 beta and I just got used to it and working with it. And that's what I used. Yeah. yeah, but, that's, yeah. That, but that's a good one. I mean, if, if you get one mic and you're going to use it for micing guitars, 57 is the one to get. Sure. I mean, cause it, it, you get. That's I would say that for most guitar players, at least rock players, that's the meat and potatoes. Like if you, if you have a 57, you can get away with pretty much anything. So. Sure. The other um, one that I tended to use a lot was the uh, Groove Tubes MD-1A, uh-huh. which is a tube uh, capsule mic. 
right? And and how would you use that one? Same way. I'll just stick it in front of the speaker until it sounded good. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And, and, and but what what did you get from that? Why did you have a second one? Did it add another layer to the sound or or? It's a darker mic. Well, so okay. it has a darker flavor. And if I wanted a bit more meat into the low mids and stuff, it was a better mic for that. And then you'd blend those or sure. did you track? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the 57 we mentioned, uh, other ones that are really popular is like the Royer 121. Yes. Uh, ribbon mic. And, and again, it, it, that one has a little bit more of of a bottom end to it, right? So you can kind of mix and match those a little bit and you get, uh, well, you can get a little thicker sound and, and just blending those, you can do wonders, just kind of having two mics doing that kind of thing. Um, the one, you know, might use a, a you know, what is that, 421, a Sennheiser 421, same ideas. I've done, did an artist, uh, fairly recently and we also had a uh ekg a 414 those are nice mics for guitars too. yeah right so well, it's the just... fun thing with the red wires though is you get an option of a lot of different mics you can get the sennheisers the neumanns yes. the Coles, all the usual suspects all the usual then, suspects and then some. and then and then some right and also experimenting with um this would be the same idea for, for a quote unquote real amp mic situation as opposed to the irs but um just mixing and matching and making sure obviously if you have two uh, mics on a cabinet check your phase obviously yes phase cancellation so you're like oh where did all the low end go uh it's usually a, a phasing issue so yep, yep. Uh, make sure that they're they're nice and, and lined up um but that i think takes care of the actual you know cabinet uh, doing that kind of thing, and of course, there's there's guys that do amazing stuff with that, with experimentation. Like, uh, what's not Valentine, Eric Valentine. Oh, guy's amazing, ridiculous. Right. So, and just again, if you have the luxury of experimenting there, just I think he puts sometimes mics out in the hallway to kind of capture something there or behind the amps or just just going nuts, basically trying to come up with something different and blending them. And you can do the same thing in the red wires. It, that's yes. what makes it so cool is that you can, you the, can work like Eric Valentine inside red wires on yeah. a single channel strip, right. or you put it across multiple channel strips with different amps and different cabinets and all that kind of stuff and blend it that way too. So there's, there's various ways of working with the software amps that are equally as experimental as the hardware versions. Yeah. And in some ways, maybe even more because you, you have the option and you got like a mic locker <laughs> that would set you back a lot of digits on it, you know, to, to have those at your disposal is great. So right. we're both huge um, or uh, IR aficionados, I suppose, and, and the software emulation. So um, which ones do you favor? I mean, I came from the first one that I got that was sort of like an emulation was the original Line 6 pod. And as much as that leaves to be desired today, it was really, really good when it came out. I remember trying that at NAMM also. It might even have been about the same time I, I, as you stumbled upon. No, I think it had to be. Had to be well, earlier. I think the pod had to be earlier. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter. But, but that was, I was like, holy crap, it actually has some some gain because that's always where things fell apart for me. Sure. Um, but it actually sounded pretty good. So we came from there and then, um, what was it? The first software I think that started getting close was uh guitar rig. I think. From yeah. Native I think I would agree with that statement. Guitar rig was the first one that really got close. Yeah. And then, but, but today there's, there's so many great, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, plugin Alliance stuff that specifically their angle emulations yeah you got, you got um, me on that one that one's pretty good yeah i like that one i like the uh the one that the, the retro what, what's the model number i have it written down i gotta read it it's the uh e765rt <laughs> retro yeah. that just flows off the tongue right? right but that one is is really 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 good um 
when I initially got it, uh, I figured, oh, Retro had, it was a deal. I think they had essentially like a two for one or something. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll do that. But uh, I imagine I wasn't going to use that a whole lot. And now I use it all the time because it gets me anything from like really, really nice clean tones to, um, I mean, distortion that would make Kerry King from Slayer blush. You know, <laughs> it's like it's uh, it, it covers the gamut and um, the response of it feels really, really good to me. There, there's that keyword again. I don't like, oh, it feels like, you know, but but it really does respond really well to, to playing. I, I really like that one. There are other ones. I don't own it, but I, I tried the demo and that's the STL Tones. Okay. The Howard Benson plugin was the same situation. I'm like, this sounds really, really good. Um, at that time, I already had the plugin alliance or I would have pulled the trigger on that one as well, but they were very, very similar in the way they felt to me. Uh, you mentioned Studio Devil. Yes, um, I did. Still really, really good. Um, you and That's I trade good. projects a lot back and forth. So, so we use that I a mean, lot. We use that a lot. Um, I like it a lot. Usually with with different, uh, with the Mix IR stuff though. Well, uh, I, I, it doesn't matter what simulation I use. I always put the Mix IR behind it. Right. Turn off the, whatever cabinet simulation or whatever they use and, and I use the Mix IRs instead. Mm -hmm. That's something that I actually don't do with the plugin alliance because it has a bunch of different uh, mic um, emulations on there as well. And uh, but you but know, that, that's the, here's the thing though: a lot of companies actually probably buy their impulse responses now from red wires. So it yes, could very well be I, that they're using the red wires anyway. Um, I don't think it's this because it has um, a lot of different. Um, Miking combination. It could very well be. I don't think that's the case with them, but um, that that's one time where, where I haven't done that. But there are other ones. I mean, companies like, uh, well, you and I are both Logic users. Yeah. Um, you don't like I, the Logic ones so much, but I tend to use them. I like the, um, for like, let's say crunchier or, or cleaner emulations. I do like those, but again, I always change those with with the irs yeah yeah, yeah. Like the always IRs turn the and cabinet that, off that and use thing. the irs there yeah. same thing with the pod farm too we use a lot of that yes uh, over the years. even though that 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 is old now. it is really old but the amps still sound really damn good especially with the mix ir cabinets behind them yeah yeah and, and now um we should probably say as well like the helix we're both huge fans of um of the mix IR stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. or the red wire stuff. But there are other companies that, that make them. I haven't played through them, but there was another company called own hammer. I think that that did uh, also a lot of packages with IR. So it and doesn't have to two, be. Is that the two notes or wall of sound? So right. That company right. There's those, is, yeah. 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 It's pretty good too. Although the latency on their interface for their impulse responses is where I fall apart with them. It was for the version that we got from Nam, I think. Yep. Uh, and that may or may not have been their final release. I don't know. But but they also have um, load boxes where you can, for live use, where yeah. you load your IRs and, and uh, can bypass it that way. So uh, As does the aux system options. from Universal Audio. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, right now I'm mixing an artist that, is a ua user and he is on just about every song he has the friedman emulation from ua which and, is good it's a really good oh it, it yeah. sounds amazing it sounds yeah. really really good um so lots and lots of options out there today so you know the, the whole idea that irs is cheating or anything like that i think is, is who says that's things. cheating let me smack I him in the face. Yeah. No, cheating, yeah. schmeating. It's not cheating. Yeah. It's called using the tools you have available. Right. Yeah. So so great, great tools. Um, big fan of those. And that's pretty much how I deal with guitars in the studio. You know, uh, making sure everything is up in the working order, choosing the right situation. Do we have an amp or situation where we're going to mic an amp? Um, are we using software? And in my case, most of the time would be, yes, yes, we are. Um, and I get good results. Yeehaw, so, baby. Yeah. Um, as an A side to a lot of this, just as a technique, I would say, um, when it comes to tracking, 
don't be afraid of layering stuff. So as far as different guitar tones and things like that. So don't be afraid of, um, oh, I got to get all my crunch from this one guitar track. Um, don't be afraid to, to use it. Duplicate also, the track, use another amp head. Layer. That kind of thing, or use something where you're playing a similar part, maybe an octave higher with a cleaner and blend those in. So lots of experimentation. But but I guess that, that goes in a little bit more to uh, arrangement arranging. and production. Right. But uh, all those options that are there is amazing. In my And right now we're soul- just talking about just guitar amps and guitars. Yes, absolutely. And I'm looking at my lonely soldano sitting up right there and hasn't been used in a minute so um is it ready to cry yeah. i don't know it still looks all cool and purple so purple I, it's, yeah it's still happy um so anything that you would like to add to that jody or should we wrap that one up i think it's time to put a bow on it let's do that so uh hopefully that's been informative to anybody listening thanks for listening thank you and and uh we'll be back with another episode where we're going to talk about uh, acoustic guitars yeah a whole other beast right there there you go all right jody have yourself a great day okay all right chris let everybody out there and inside this record oh man i forgot the name of the place already inside the recording studio